Okay, so um, we had some uh, challenges, but maybe it's actually better. So instead of uh, giving a presentation on one computer, I'm just going to use both, and we're just going to like switch back and forth. But um, if there's like some some stalls or whatever, then just like yeah, maybe just enjoy it. Okay. So, right. So this is my talk called uh, Dodging Silver Bullets, Emergence in Distributed Architectures. This is not about uh, immutable data structures, maybe as the, uh, uh, the pamphlet indicated, but instead this is a, a talk about uh, very complex software architectures like microservices. Now, we've seen some really great material, even books, about how to do microservices. This is not about the how, but instead the why and the when. So the hope then is that we're kind of going to build, we're going to explore some ideas and we're going to build up sort of an analytic framework for understanding the roles that uh, microservices play in our organization and when it's going to be appropriate for us. So let's get into it. But first, maybe we should talk a little about um, who I am, okay? So uh, I'm a distributed systems engineer and data scientist who's been working in the field for maybe 15 or, or, or 20 years, depending on, on how you count it. Is the mic working? Yeah? Um, I've worked in a lot of different industries from climate uh, to financial products, and recently in, um, in music. Uh, working mostly with, with data, large data systems, data pipelines, Hadoop, these sorts of things, but also somehow microservices. I kind of straddle the fence between academia and industry, where I usually uh, have a job but do academic collaborations on the point. And I think that this has the benefit of giving me kind of uh, an interesting uh, perspective that sort of informs my practice and, of course, uh, this work. Why are we listening to me? Okay. So I, for the past five years, I, I worked at a, a, a not-so-small company called SoundCloud um, where we went through this sort of uh, microservice transition. And it was like this very important uh, part of my career, very, very informative. Uh, and I wanted to know uh, why did it hurt so bad and what would I do differently next time? Uh, the problem is that you know having these kind of uh, e experiences are quite rare as engineers. Um, it's very rare that you get to grow a company from 50 to 400 people in, in, in five years and to go through all those, those growing pains. So it wasn't clear to me whether uh, my experience was generalizable or not. So I left, I left SoundCloud and started uh, doing research for a book and doing case studies with um, some friends that I had made along the way of my career. So I've been working with some of these very nice companies. Uh, Shopify is a, is a big sort of retail platform in, uh, in Canada. eBay Klagenzeigen is, of course, the eBay uh, specific to the, to the German market. And then Zalando is kind of like this very large um, competitor to something like Amazon. Yeah? And these companies are all in retail, but they vary uh, both in where they are in time, in, in terms of their evolution, market adaptation, uh, size of company, and even their approach to infrastructure. For instance, uh, Zalando has you know, been migrating to microservices from a set of, of, of Java apps. Klagenzeigen is like a mix of large infrastructure projects and sort of monolithic applications. And then Shopify has like hundreds of developers that are still working on a giant Ruby on Rails application in a single repository. So these varied experiences have given me like a very interesting perspective on the evolution uh, of companies and are sort of framing uh, the, the, the talk that I, that I hope to give to you today. So this is going to be more of a, um, an exploration of ideas, uh, all revolving around this, this core question of, of why, uh, why would we do microservices and when are they appropriate for me or for an organization. And we're going to explore that with, with these uh, few topics. So we're going to look at architectures that partition domains, where we're going to be using sort of the domain-driven design um, uh, framework or whatever uh, to describe some of the conditions that affect different companies. Then we're going to go into the politics and economy of software architecture, which is kind of the side which I'm the most interested in because it's not the technical, but it sort of dives deep into how people make decisions and what motivates them. Uh, then we're going to talk about emergent tensions, so understanding the signs of, of growing pains in, in organizations and also uh, a certain creature. Then we're going to introduce this idea of domain entropy, which is like this idea that I've been uh, developing to sort of e explain how um, complex systems tend to break down. And finally, we're going to motivate our answer to why and when uh, microservices and distributed architectures are, are, are relevant. Uh, 
with this idea of evolving in parallel, this need for an organization to do many things at once, and, and sort of tie that into um, uh, some of the, the, the pain points that we experience at, at SoundCloud. So first, we should probably get a little bit particular about the subject matter here. So this talk is about distributed architectures um, because they become more, more, more popular. I think in, the, in a modern enterprise, uh, we're trying to relive the, so or resolve some of the problems that SOA uh, gave us, uh, but in new ways, in new ways with, with, with more modern tools. So for me, this is a really interesting subject matter uh, to, to, to study, as uh, maybe it's not always going right. You know, as a, as a researcher, you don't want to work in a, in a field that is fully solved, but instead in, in a space in which there's a lot of people that are, that are suffering some problems that you could sort of, of generalize. So here, we're, we're really going to focus on this, this, this form of distribution, but not in the um, you know, running on multiple machines sense. So we're not talking just about uh, software that, that runs in the cloud. But instead, in particular, we're going to talk about um, uh, architectures which facilitate the distribution of domains. So in the microservice uh, framework, you would probably have you know, one microservice that is, is responsible for the users, right, or authentication, and then another one that is maybe represented for articles or for, um, for shops or whatever in the, uh, in the, in the retail space. Uh, so in this way, they, they allow you to distribute um, domains not just over uh, infrastructure or over computers, but over uh, different services and even over different teams. So that's kind of the, the grounding. And this sort of pattern emerges in, in different places, right? So of course, microservices is the, uh, the most common one, but I would argue that data pipelines uh, are sort of like a special case in which your computation is, is a little bit uh, asynchronous or is completely asynchronous. Um, and mostly, the computation is going in, in one way where you consume from one source and provide to another. So you're not in this sort of request response loop, uh, but it still follows the same pattern as facilitating the distribution of domains. Right? So micro, uh, smart contracts are sort of a new uh, player to the, to the field, but I would argue that the interaction between smart contracts are also going to encapsulate domains, produce the same problems, the same emergent tensions, and maybe we could use the same uh, generalized principles to do them coherently. Right? So what we want to do now is we want to look at these architectures uh, not from a technical perspective, but uh, instead across uh, uh, multiple dimensions. Right? So architectural decisions, when we commit to building one of these things, uh, it's both expensive and long-lasting. We are not making these sorts of decisions every day, uh, probably not uh, every quarter, and I would argue uh, not even every year. Right? So making the right decision about these things requires taking a broad view of the impact that it's going to have on our, our product, on our organization, and uh, our potential success. Right? So this portion outline of the talk really looks at software from a different perspective. Uh, one that is not uh, consumed with the technical implications, but instead on the people implications, <laughs> on how our software structures are reflected in our organizational structures and even into our economic structures. But first, let's just talk about some of the direct and immediate consequences of, uh, of investing in something like microservices. So distributed architectures require infrastructure. You know, this is one of the things that precludes them from being used at smaller companies, is they usually constitute a large investment in things that are not directly tied to the business, or a, a little bit more difficult to, to tie to the business. If you wanted to do something like uh, microservices, or if you want to do something like, like data pipelines, you would probably need a Hadoop cluster, right? You'd be committing to operating and maintaining a very expensive distributed system. And the question is, how many distributed system engineers do you have? How many do you need? How many should you need to uh, run your business in your way? So you're sort of committing to this large infrastructure investment. Uh, and this is really, uh, I would like to qualify this by saying that it's kind of a prerequisite of before you could commit to something like microservices, there are certain things that you absolutely need solved. You know, if you were to be trying to deploy a single monolith, you know, having a manual script would probably work for you. If you have a proliferation of small services, each with their own teams and deployment pipelines, or they would probably need uh, uh, some kind of generalized deployment pipeline to make that uh, uh, feasible. And finally, if you were to operate a single, uh, a single application on a single machine, it'd be very easy to, to debug. 
it'd be very easy to figure out what this thing is doing, or relatively easy compared to working in distributed architectures, which proliferate heterogeneity, and you need a, a, some kind of solution to observability. You need something like Prometheus or a pretty competent, um, pretty competent uh, Nagios installation. So all of this means that uh, before you make a decision about distributed architectures, you need to know where you're at in terms of infrastructure. So next, I would say that these sorts of decisions, they really shape the economies. Now, uh, by economy here, I'm not talking about uh, interest rates. I'm not talking about things happening uh, in, in, in governments. I'm talking about the economies that, that happen locally at, 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 at companies, uh, in teams, and even in software. So economies is kind of like this resource question of like how expensive is one decision versus another, or how, um, how cheap is, is one solution over another, and understanding how what's expensive and what's cheap uh, shapes people's decisions. For instance, uh, in microservices, uh, having uh, mo a heterogeneity of uh, runtimes is very cheap, just because one of your, your, your programmers likes Go and another one likes Scala doesn't mean that they can't collaborate, right? On the other hand, uh, having something like consistent testing or even coding style consistency e across microservices, well, that becomes much more expensive. It's not something that you could inherit from the environment. You need to build a process, perhaps provide some linting, some common tools, or whatever. And some d someone's got to build that. This is uh, uh, sort of a prerequisite to having coherence uh, that would be very cheap if you were to use a single repository, if you were to use, uh, if you were to b building a, a monolithic uh, application. So in this way, the types of architectures that we commit to, they shape the economy, and we need to uh, think about it in a different way. And lastly, architectures also become endowed with this politics, right? Not politics, again, not in the global sense, as in you're voting for a president, but instead how people organize to make decisions, how people organize to make decisions. So in Microsoft, or it, if you have a monolithic web application and you want to do a release, you know, Maybe there's uh, a branch that is not ready. Maybe there's some code that is half done, some feature flag, or whatever. So consensus has to be formed on everyone who's touching the code base, which might be a lot of people. So by choosing this, this, this monolithic uh, uh, architecture, you're also committing to uh, a method of which your, your teams are expected to form consensus. Actually, they need to form consensus. By contrast, if you're doing something like microservices, which can run in any number of repos, in any number of, um, of, of of, of runtimes, there need be no consensus. Our consensus is quite cheap because it becomes more local. So in this way, the architecture that we choose uh, is really shaping our politics. You know, uh, but all of these, all these different dimensions that we've evaluated, which of course include the technical, but hopefully are somehow an extension, um, they all come with risks. Right. Primarily, uh, one of the biggest risks in, in, in making a wrong architectural decision is becoming dependent on technology we don't understand. Um, so event sourcing as an idea has a lot of compelling arguments. You know, immutability, uh, distribution of, uh, of domains, better methods for collaboration, right? But maybe your team is not ready to operate Kafka. You know, Kafka is a very complex distributed system, uh, and you might not have distributed uh, system engineers yet. And it may take a long time to either train them or to uh, find them in the field. And I would argue mostly you should, you should, you should train them and account for this uh, in making decisions uh, about uh, architecture. So in this way, there's always this risk that the decisions we make are going to imply uh, commitment to, uh, to technology that we might not fully understand. And next, I think there is this risk of investing in false economies. Sometimes we posit that we need something like microservices because we're going to build so many things, we're going to test so many things, we're going to explore so much of the, of, of, the, of the solution space, right, that we need to do so on quick iterative cycles. But I would say, why? Is your business so uncertain? Like, how, maybe you're already profitable. Maybe you already know what your customers need, and they need uh, something with some kind of reliability and, and, and regularity, but you might not be doing as much exploration as, uh, as you think. So in this way, we need to consider what are the advantages of the architectures that we, that, that we choose and what is the exact part of the process that we need to be cheap and what, what part can we tolerate uh, being expensive and not invest in false economies. Great. And lastly, and I think this is probably um, 
the most important, uh, the largest risk in committing to one of these distributed architectures is inflaming organizational tensions that might already be there. So usually when you're building something, there are people, there's something that you built before. And those people might have a politics or a, an economy or processes which are reliant on the old way. You know, for instance, if you have very senior engineers that are used to reviewing every code that, uh, uh, that is committed to the, the most important apps, right? All of a sudden, people don't start, or people stop committing to one app and start committing to, you know, a proliferation of microservices. In this way, you're changing this person's job, right? Or maybe you're changing the jobs of a set of people, right? And already, there might have been this tension. People might have been fed up that there was, the, you know, some person bearing criticism on them in the, in the repo, but it created a lot of stability. And by diffusing responsibility and diffusing uh, your, your domain, you might be inflaming these, these latent tensions and worsening something that's already going on. So in this way, it, it, it's kind of clear that distributed architectures are not a silver bullet, and there is a circumstance um, in which they're relevant, and I, I kind of want to uh, explore that uh, a bit. I think it's uh, important that we, uh, we reflect on the conditions that are important or that are going to determine outcomes, uh, because I don't think everyone working in the field is. Um, from mentoring uh, lots of startups, both in, in Palestine and in, in, um, in Germany, I was shocked to see that people would immediately uh, go to microservices when they're starting their company, as an implicit assumption that in 2017, uh, microservices are just the way. And I definitely don't think that's the case because I've, uh, I've seen it fail. But I want to provide, you know, an analytic framework for sharing this knowledge so people can make decisions for themselves, right? So there's definitely no silver bullet. But to do this, I think we need to understand not only the how, uh, but more specifically, the why and the when. I think that engineers are how biased. We love knowing how to deploy Kubernetes, how to scale um, uh, Kafka or one of these systems and imp improving our code craft and our knowledge that we believe has the biggest bearing on, uh, on technical outcomes. So the argument uh, in, this, in this talk is that it doesn't. Instead, I think we should focus on why and when questions. Specifically, why questions have this very powerful property of integrating different perspectives. You know, when I was working at SoundCloud, I used to have lunch with, uh, with, with, with one of the executives that was not directly involved with the technical organization, but, you know, it was an open company, so everyone knew what the technical organization was doing, you know. And he used to ask me, uh, what is this Prometheus thing that I keep hearing about? You know, I'm looking at infrastructure's roadmap, and I see Prometheus development, and then I look at app team development, and it says Prometheus integration. What is Prometheus, right? And I said, well, we run a, a, a website that, that, that makes money uh, when it's up, right? And then when it's down, we don't make any money. And he's like, oh, yes, I like it when the website's up. And I say, yeah, but, you know, <laughs> we've been having this problem uh, keeping it up. And he's like, oh, yes, I've noticed, and I hate it. And I said, well, the problem is that we have lots of, of microservices now, and they're all doing different things, uh, and the truth is we don't know what those things are. And he says, well, but you built them. He's like, yes, we built them. Like, how could you build something? and then not understand it. I said, actually, that's, that's, that's quite common in engineering, that you would build something uh, and then not understand uh, what it's doing. He's like, well, what are you going to do about it? Oh, we're going to build a tool. We're going to build a tool that gives us better observability of a process so we can collect knowledge, and then we can make better decisions and keep the website open. He says, oh, that's great. How do we do that? Well, we built this thing called Prometheus. So why are we building Prometheus, right? Because we need to understand our software in a way of which we clearly don't. We don't, right? Um, and he said, that sounds great. So in this way, it is not the, the how, it is not that, you know, Prometheus is written in Go and it follows this model that was, um, you know, spread at, at, at Google or that there's brilliant engineers working on it, it's built on LevelDB. Irrelevant. Irrelevant for a CEO. Instead, he needs to understand the context in which this investment makes sense. And this is primarily a why question. Okay. Now this is a more ambitious statement, um, which I hope to substantiate. Uh, but when questions predict outcomes, right? So looking at something like microservices or looking something at like making an investment <laughs> in an observability tool are not simply about having a proper answer to, to why, but a lot of it is about timing, you know? Uh, so at SoundCloud, we tried lots of things, including feature teams and having SREs uh, and 
lots of different distributed systems. And you know, sometimes it uh, worked out and sometimes it didn't. You know? When we tried doing uh, uh, feature teams, for instance, uh, we thought that we could take you know, our iOS team, uh, which was five people, and then spread them over you know, 10 different feature teams and then, and then switch it up. Right? Uh, and we tried this with, with SREs as well. We, we had you know, three or four SREs, and we thought we could sort of like sprinkle them across different parts of the, the organization. So it was a really good idea. You know, SRE is, is, a, is a very successful culture. We know that feature teams is very prominent uh, in, our, in our industry. Uh, but what are the circumstances in which they're, they're relevant? Well, I think you just need a certain staff number. Or you need to understand how many things you're doing in parallel. How, how, how thin are you, are you spreading uh, labor? And this is fundamentally uh, a when question, that there's a timing in which these solutions make sense. And uh, if we don't understand that timing, if we, don't, uh, if we don't understand that context, then we might take a, a, a good idea and misapply it. So this is a fundamental when question. So all of these, you know, I hope to actually answer them. Like, not just pose them in the, in the abstract, but explore them and, and provide answers. But I, I very quickly want to talk about lobsters, okay? So um, lobsters are the uh, national crustacean of Canada, where I'm, where I'm from. Um, they're, they're bottom feeders, and they're, they're, they're just absolutely delicious. They're amazing things, right? So during the uh, reproduction, a female will lay up to 10,000 eggs, 10,000 eggs, of which uh, only a tenth of 1% will survive. Uh, that's about 10 eggs. Very few. Uh, so, but when they're when they're born, uh, lap, uh, well, when they're old, like in the picture, right? They have these these shells that that protect them, that provide them uh, integrity and, and make sure they don't get eaten so easily by predators. It's not really the claws; it's mostly uh, the shell. Uh, but when they're born, they don't. They're they're born as, as plankton. They're these little vulnerable things that could be sucked up by, by by whales or even even smaller things. But eventually, you know, a lobster will, will grow up and, and develop a, a, a shell and, and gain some integrity and, and protection. But even that, there's, there's kind of this problem, right? That the, the shell of a lobster is, is quite hard, you know? It's, uh, it's solid, that's what protects it. Uh, but the part inside is squishy and it's, uh, it's growing, it's growing. So like a lot of crustaceans, uh, lobsters go through this process of malting. Right? So they get uh, a little bit uncomfortable in their, in their shell. So the thing that is uh, protecting them is actually causing them quite a bit of, uh, of pain. You know? So what they do is they, uh, they, they suck up a bunch of water to sort of like expand the shell to its limit, and then they kind of starve themselves. Actually, they reduce the amount of resources that they intake until they're small enough to both uh, crack the shell and, uh, and wiggle out of it. And then they have to sort of like hide. Uh, they can't hunt for, uh, I think it's like two days or something like this until the, um, the new shell uh, develops, right? So there's this, th this idea that um, sometimes growth is painful. Sometimes uh, the thing that, uh, that, that protects us, right, is also the thing that, that, that's holding us back. And we need to go through these periods of vulnerability um, before we can uh, continue to grow. But of course, we don't want to just apply this to, to lobsters. We want to apply it to, to, to the companies and to, and to software, you know? And so I want to apply this, this, this method to explaining uh, one of my, my favorite times at SoundCloud. You know, I was there for, for five years, but there were, there were three years in particular that were kind of the most volatile. You know? um, they really taught me a lot about engineering, about organization, about technology, and, and, and about business. Um, and you know, it was informing my work now. So back in 2012, uh, we were kind of like, uh, I think, 50 people or, 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 or so. Um, and we were going through this process that was mainly about, pr did you have a question? Or just stretching? No stretching, yeah, that's good. Um, going through this process of platform uh, proliferation. So we went from like an iOS app to, uh, sorry, we went from a, a web application, you know, it was a website, and then we wanted an iOS app and Android and widgets and, and all this nonsense. Um, and, and, and it was, you know, quite, quite interesting. Um, interesting is a, is a nice way to put it, uh, super painful. Is, is, is another way to, to put it. And I want to share some of those experiences with you. Great. So what it, in back in 2000, things, uh, everything was, was kind of centralized. It was small enough a company that uh, ev like there was you know, a, an app team or like a developer team that was you know, in contrast to the uh, infrastructure team, I would say. Uh, and they were so small that they could you know, sit uh, at the same table that you could just ask someone uh, what they were doing and they were across, you know, you could look at them in the face and then they would tell you, you know, it was great. Uh, and everyone was sort of working on a single uh, monolithic 
Ruby on Rails application. And this, of course, Ruby on Rails application was, was all in one repo. Um, but the effect of this was, 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 was quite particular. Uh, and I want to go back to this domain-driven design uh, language and claim that a lot of the advantages uh, that this team structure, this architecture structure had was that it kept uh, the integrity of the domain. So everyone, uh, when people would say, oh, the place controller uh, needs that field, right? Everyone had the same idea about what that meant, you know? Um, but of course, that could not last. That could not survive growth. So there were a lot of things that were changing. There were new users that were, that were coming in, uh, maybe uh, like 10% uh, growth uh, month over month. Uh, and there was a lot of new uses. You know, the feature, uh, the things that SoundCloud w w was doing was, was changing. We went from, you know, developing one feature at a time to developing, you know, four or five, right? We had this platform proliferation where all of a sudden we need to work in iOS as well as in, um, uh, on the web. And as you know, iOS has certain visual metaphors, certain things that, that make sense for, or that are platform specific. Uh, that may not correspond to what's going on uh, on web. Like the, the, the user interface is different, and that the, the metaphors of that user interface, they, they leak down into the, the domain no knowledge. Um, and all of that was while surviving hypergrowth, while uh, things were happening uh, at, at such a clip that you didn't really have time to contextualize. You're really just trying to keep your, your, your head above water. So we started adding people to the team. Uh, with the hopes of uh, not slowing down, but instead actually uh, speeding up. And this resulted in a lot of these, what I call emergent, tension, uh, emergent tensions. So emergent here, um, it means the things that you do not plan that are somehow inevitable or consequential, uh, are consequences of the things that you did plan. So we might think that we were uh, adding people uh, to a team and that you know, we would get uh, more velocity, more labor, uh, we, we would move faster. Uh, but what we did not expect, for instance, is that uh, cliques would develop. So with five people uh, working on, on a team, uh, you could have a stand-up, you know, and you could get through it in, in, in 10 minutes, you know. Uh, at 20 people uh, in a team, uh, doing a stand-up is super painful. It's super painful. You know, you're waiting for people to go, your legs are getting sore, and actually at some point you become disinterested. Maybe, maybe because you're not a nice person, but also maybe because what you're doing is just so different than the person who went before that that information is not helping you, right? And there's this tension because you don't want to tell them like, hey, I'm actually not interested in what you're saying. You know, maybe that'd be, that, that's too rude, it's too harsh, right? But that's the truth. So this is one of these emergent tensions. It's the things that we don't uh, plan, uh, but sort of uh, inevitably rise. And worse, sometimes the things we don't talk about. Yeah? So another thing that would happen is we get these pull request battle royales, right? I don't know if, who has experienced a battle royale on a GitHub pull request? The rest of you are liars. Okay. I think it's, it's one of those things that you, you realize that on a single code base, um, there is this uh, spread of concerns. So some people who were on the team for a long time were trying to keep some coding style, right? And other people coming from different backgrounds or whatever, they wanted a different coding style. And every time that there was a pull request, right, the question was not, hey, does this feature work? Does it, is it well tested or whatever? But does it imply some kind of change in style? Is there an evolution of, of, of the model, which we didn't uh, plan on doing, but is happening, is emergent, is kind of happening naturally because there's just different people uh, uh, working on, on the software. Yeah? And the worst part of this, the worst part of this is when domain objects start adopting different meanings, right? So you have some people who are working on the code base from the iOS pr perspective, and then other people are working on it from the web perspective, right? And actually, they need different fields. So what constitutes these core uh, domain objects, right? They change different def definitions, and they change interpretations. Uh, one of the worst cases of that was with uh, spam, that we protected spam from certain sources and not from others, right? So when you look at uh, a count of, of, of how many plays you got per day, people would have different ideas. One was with spam protection, and the other with not, right? This is a, a disaster. But the point of all this is that because things were, were, were going so fast, because evolution was happening uh, in parallel on multiple product ideas, but also across multiple dimensions, you know, uh, our code was changing, the infrastructure requirements that, that, that we had were changing, our politics were changing, 
and also the economy of keeping consistency and, and coherence was fundamentally uh, changing. So everything hurt, and it was hard to pinpoint uh, what was the, the, the actual cause. But the result was, was, was kind of clear, actually, velocity gridlock. So we went from being able to you know, release three products uh, a week or like, you know, do a, a feature you know, overnight or whatever to it taking weeks, weeks of, of forming consistent, of pull request battle royales, of realizing the, uh, the, um, the, the infrastructure implications of some of the decisions uh, we make. And this was very painful. And at the time, you know, it was very easy to just start blaming. Maybe we hired the wrong people. Maybe um, we're not using the right technology. We need to rewrite the Ruby on Rails application in Node.js or something. Um, but I don't believe that. I don't believe that the, the, the problems were technical. Instead, uh, I believe it was a product of, of, of a term that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to introduce here uh, called domain entropy. So the rest of the, the talk will be, uh, again, uh, about process of software evolution, of, of, of going through these transitions into which we, 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 we break out of our shells uh, and go through these periods of vulnerability, uh, become stronger at the end. And entropy is going to be our framework that we use to explain this. So uh, entropy is like a, a common word. It's used in a lot of fields. Um, of course, in, in thermodynamics uh, and, and, and inf information theory. Uh, but I think one of them is quite relevant to this context, right? And uh, my favorite use of entropy, which I'm going to use to sort of bootstrap our definition, is, uh, is social entropy. So social entropy uh, implies the tendency of social networks and societies in general to break down over time, moving from cooperation advancement uh, towards conflict and chaos, right? So we know that when this happens, it happens in, a, in our teams. Maybe we, we hire too many people, or we hire too many people from ThoughtWorks, or something happens that we, we, we know that we used to have co uh, cohesion, uh, and now we just can't form consensus anymore. So social entropy is like a really good explanation of that. But again, I want to put this into the, uh, the domain-driven design framework. Right? So effectively, I'm going to use Conway's law. Um, Conway's law states that you know, the, the software we build reflect the communication uh, boundaries of the, um, of the organization which produce it. But I also believe, I want to extend this to uh, include domains. So domain entropy, uh, as a conclusion of this process, is you know, uh, uh, entropy implies the tendency for domains to break down over time, moving from coherent uh, towards uh, conflict and chaos. So this is not when our, uh, our teams are arguing or when our, when our software is, uh, stops moving forward, but instead it when our definitions about the business problems that we're solving uh, are the driver for this, for this conflict. So when people cannot agree uh, what terms they're using to describe their, their domain, communication breaks down, and software simply doesn't have a chance. Right? So this is why we're developing th this idea. Uh, and I want to give a, a, a concrete example and talk about spam again. So internet platforms, they tend to grow to the point which spam becomes a real problem. As this problem grows, spam becomes its own domain. So originally, when we started getting uh, attacked by people who wanted to, uh, at, at SoundCloud, when, when people wanted to fake play counts, you know, because they wanted to look much more popular uh, than, we di than they did, you know, we, did, we had to respond immediately, you know, uh, in, in, in no time at all. Uh, so we just put an IP filter. We found out the people that were, were causing trouble, and we just blacklisted them. You know, super easy. We did this in the, uh, the, the, the Rails middleware uh, or, or whatever, uh, and this worked, you know, sort of well. But it turns out that if people are incentivized enough, they'll find more sophisticated uh, ways of attacking internet platforms, and of course, they'll just get a new IP address. They'll just buy a cloud provider <laughs> and rotate through IPs. They have built into um, to, to proxy software, even. So of course you need to um, you need to evolve the domain. You need to evolve the definition of spam. You need to contextualize uh, 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 domain objects within this idea that some of them could be valid, and others cannot. But doing this inside a Ruby on Rails application with an IP filter is very difficult. If you say that spam is so important that we want to hire you know the best spam engineer, you know we're going to get them from from Stanford, fly them in, uh, best woman on the job. Let's do it, right? And then you say your job is to write Ruby on Rails. Right? You need a PhD uh, in machine learning uh, with a specialization in spam, uh, and you're going to write Rails middleware. But this doesn't really make sense, does it? 
these people have different expectations. They want, you know, a, tr a test set, a training set, and even a validation set for hyperparameters or whatever. And none of those are, are very um, easy to get in this, in, in this formulation. So in this way, our domain was kind of trapped by software. We wanted to expand our understanding of what, um, of what spam was. We wanted to staff it properly, but pay money and, uh, and improve it, but actually couldn't because, of, uh, because of, of, of the architectural decisions that we made, right? So we were suffering from this, uh, this problem of domain entropy, right? And the key to remember is that, you know, new domains, they require integrity. They deserve representation across these different levels. So they decide, like, people who have that expertise should be able to maintain and develop it, right, and have integrity over their, their, their domain. Uh, software, which is like a codification of a domain uh, and is executable almost by, by after effect, you know, requires integrity. It should be in a place that, that is conducive to the natural processes of that domain. People should be able to write machine learning algorithms to solve machine learning uh, 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 problems, right? Um, and when, when too many domains are, 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 are sharing teams or sharing software, I don't think this is, this is, this is quite possible. I think we need to design our, our, our infrastructure in such a way that we expect this natural evolution, that things are going to uh, uh, emerge as uh, new domain objects with people uh, with specialization in them and, um, and the ability to do that quickly. So coming back to this, this why question then, of like why would we in invest in, uh, in, in microservices, given all the risk and all the investment that we have to uh, make to get it, I would say that these, these distributed architectures enable this parallel evolution by endowing our domains with integrity, right? If something is its own service and needs to change runtime, if we need to create a spam service, the way that that's populated, the way that that's in, in, informed by, by data is completely independent. We could take that service and we could give it to a new team. We could call it, we could transition from the app team in the general to the spam team in the, in the particular. And the focus here is to enable this process of parallel evolution. I think that companies have a tendency, especially unprofitable companies, uh, tend to evolve quite quickly, uh, fast enough that they don't run out of money. You know, this is the, uh, the economic imperative. And without parallel evolution, I don't think they really stand a chance. I don't think it's, it's quite possible. So this is our, our, our answer to the why question. Why would we invest in micro, uh, microservices? Principally to enable parallel evolution. Now the question of when. When is it uh, the, imp uh, the imperative? Well, it's when you're going to not make money if you can't explore different ideas at the same time, right? So maybe there's a, a, a large amount of uncertainty in your, uh, in, in, in your business case. So as a music platform, right, there are no profitable music uh, streaming services. Not Apple, not Spotify, uh, SoundCloud soon, but not yet, you know? Um, so this is, this is a, a business model that fundamentally uh, uh, incentivizes uh, parallel evolution. You need to try new things because so far, of all the people working in this, in this space, all of them have been wrong. Or sorry, none of them have been right. Um, right. So recognizing the uncertainty in your, in, your, in your business domain and reflecting this in the architectural decisions that you make is sort of the imperative. So what do we talk about? Uh, lots of things, lots of things in a, in a short amount of time, right? But principally, we talked about architectures that partition domain. So this was really to bring in this domain-driven design uh, language and, and framework. Then we talked about uh, emergent tensions, both in, uh, in the general, you know, that they come in political and economic uh, means, but also in the particular, like looking at, at, at what happened at, at SoundCloud between 2012 and 2015. Then we actually invented something new. This concept of domain entropy, which is meant to explain the process of which certain things that start out as easy get quite painful. And tried to tie that to, um, uh, to, to certain very measurable effects, or certain things that we could, we could recognize and then uh, change. And then we really incentivized this, this whole idea about distributed architectures. We answered the, the why and when question uh, based on parallelism, as in what does our business need to do, and then how can software make that happen? So what's the takeaway? Distributed architectures resolve emerging tensions in collaboration between domains evolving in parallel. So notice none of this is about performance. None of this is about reliability. 
but instead about what's going on in the domain, which is somehow the best representation of, uh, of what's going on in the business. Thank you very much.